This meeting is now being recorded. So great. Let's get started. Joining the meeting. Hello. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for participating in the How to Use the Alliance's M&E Social Impact Joining Framework the meeting. Partner Webinar. My name is Kavanaugh Livingston, and I am a Senior Associate for Partnerships at the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves. This webinar is part of a series that provides an introduction to the Alliance for new and current partners and an overview of how we work, the benefits of partnership, highlights, upcoming opportunities for partners, and features on specific tools, resources, or engagement activities. After a short introduction on the Alliance, I will then hand over the presentation to our presenters, Rachel Mahmood, Senior Associate for Gender at the Alliance, who will provide an overview of the Alliance ICRW Joint Joining the meeting and the new framework, as well as the Alliance's gender strategy, and Lillian Winograd, a Gender and Development Specialist for the International Center for Research on Women, who will discuss using the Ebony Framework to measure meaningful social and economic benefits that partners can create for users, employees, and entrepreneurs in the sector. We will begin with a quick overview of the Alliance of Meeting. For those who are new to the Alliance, our objective is to create a thriving global market of clean cookstoves and fuels. This initiative was created in response to the persistent problem of household air pollution, which impacts 3 billion people who rely on solid fuels to cook their daily meals. This issue results in numerous impacts on human health, the environment, and climate, local economies and livelihoods, and women and girls. The Alliance was launched in 2010 by a number of founding partners with a mission to address this multifaceted challenge. The Alliance adoption goal of 100 million households by 2020 is now at the midpoint, and we are ahead of our projecting, projections, reaching over 50 million households with clean and slash or efficient cookstoves and fuel. Our market-based approach is built on three core strategies. Through a consultative process with sector experts shortly after our launch and building upon the lessons learned by our partners over past decades, Joining the, meeting. the Alliance determined that a market-based approach was the most effective way to reach our 100 million adoption target. Our approach is based on, built on three core strategies and drives all of the work we do at the Alliance, strengthening supply, enabling markets, and enhancing demand. The Alliance Secretariat, which is based in Washington, D.C., coordinates global activities with our market managers who are present Joining in the our focused countries in which we go deep, with targeted support for clean cooking, and who serve our locally based partners in the country or region. We are also pleased to report that the Alliance now has over 1,600 partners from a diverse range of sectors Joining and fields the who are actively working to support and grow the clean cooking sector. If you are not a registered partner, we encourage you to join at cleancookstoves.org slash partner. Now a quick overview of benefits of being an alliance partner. What does it mean to be an alliance partner and how can you take advantage of some of these opportunities? The short answer is becoming a partner is the best way to stay informed of alliance activities globally and in country. Benefits of partnership include assistance with resources and capacity development, networking, as well as enhanced visibility. If you have any further questions and partnership benefits, please contact the alliance. Finally, we would like to inform you of new resources and upcoming opportunities. 
The Alliance recently released the Gender-Based Violence in Humanitarian Settings, Cookstoves and Fuels, a white paper. This paper outlines evidence and highlights gaps in knowledge on the impact that adoption of clean and slash or efficient cookstoves and fuels can have on reducing the risk and incidence of gender-based violence. In addition, the Alliance is also launching a platform to showcase the communications materials and methods being used by Alliance partners to promote clean cooking. We are developing a web-based clean cooking behavior change communication catalog. This online library will allow partners to access, access examples of media, as well as creative briefs, reports, toolkits, and evaluation results to learn and build from previous and existing work being conducted to promote clean Joining cooking. the meeting. If your organization has behavior oh, change communication, awareness raising, or marketing materials related to clean cooking, please send them to knowledge at cleancookstoves.org to have them included in the forthcoming catalog. Thank you for um, listening to that brief overview. I will now hand over the presentation to my colleague, Rachel. Joining the meeting. Hello, everyone. This okay. is Rachel Mahmood. I'm the Senior Program Associate for Gender at the Alliance. Um, and this morning and afternoon, evening, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the Alliance gender strategy and why the social impact M&E framework is key for us to best integrate gender into the clean cooking sector. So as some of you may know, um, gender and women's empowerment is a core component of the Alliance's strategy and mission statement. We have designed a specific gender strategy to ensure that um, gender equality and women's economic empowerment are mainstream throughout all of the Alliance activities. As you can see from the slide here, we have a few key areas uh, where our work is focused, including building the evidence and sharing data, building the capacity of enterprises through gender capacity building and other support services by increasing access to finance for programs that enhance women's economic empowerment and look at gender mainstreaming, as well as raising awareness around um, the different you know, gender Joining issues that are impacted in, by the clean cooking sector and sending and influencing policies within the energy sector and in the gender community. So today we're going to focus on this area around building the evidence and sharing data. This is where developing key um, methods and methodologies for monitoring and evaluation in the clean cooking sector is essential. So we have come together with the International Center for Research on Women, who is the leading expert on applied research on gender in the developing world. And we've partnered with them to design this social and economic monitoring and evaluation framework. Um, and so, of course, they were identified as the key partner to conduct this type of work. However, it was a very collaborative effort across Joining a number of alliance partners, both on the implementing side, the NGO sector, investors, donors, and key gender, as well as energy experts. So we initiated this process by convening a steering committee, committee and we hosted a two-day meeting in Washington, D.C., where we looked at all of the different impact areas around social and economic outcomes relating to the clean cooking sector. And we worked as a group across different areas of expertise to prioritize how we wanted to measure and set a framework for the entire sector. So ICRW then, with the outcomes from that steering committee meeting, um, worked to finalize a conceptual framework, which is looking at both um, women and men engaged in the clean cooking value chain, looking at the livelihood outcomes, as well as looking at the users of clean cooking products and how the different social and economic impacts can impact their lives. So uh, out of that 
process, we have a conceptual framework as well as a set of indicators and surveys that were designed. And then ICRW went into the field and tested out those surveys in four different countries with, sorry, in three countries with four partners. So those countries were India, Uganda, and Kenya. And as they went through that process, they continually revised those surveys to adapt for any, you know, learning and knowledge that they found on in the field and from feedback from those enterprises. And then they also shared the surveys and the other tools with the network of um, experts in that steering committee and co who conducted a peer review and provided additional feedback to ICRW. And so now we're at the point where the entire toolkit is final and we are officially launching it Joining to the, the public on our website and through social media this week. So we do have a URL which we'll share with you later on in the presentation um, where you can access and download all of the materials for this social impact measurement system. So from here, I'm going to hand it over to Lillian, who is going to dive a little bit deeper into that process and help you learn how you might use this tool within your business or your um, program around clean cooking. Thank you. And <clears throat> thank you for that introduction, Rachel. Um, so my name is Lillian Winograd. I work with the International Center for Research on Women here in Washington, D.C., where we have a lot of experience um, implementing and testing and working on different strategies to capture and to make more effective um, efforts to promote women's empowerment, and especially in my uh, particular portfolio, we work a lot on women's economic empowerment. So, um, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to move that along. So what I want to do today quickly is sort of talk on a bit about the why, the what, and then spend a little more time on the how. How does the system work and how does it function? And um, what would you get out of using the system? So um, ICRW is interested in clean energy, especially clean and or efficient cook stoves and fuels, because they make real contributions to reductions in women's unpaid care work burden, by which we mean the work that people and households do to collect fuel, to cook meals, and that burden falls disproportionately on women and girls in the developing world. Um, we care because this is a sector that has the potential to uh, lead to improved social and economic well-being for households. Um, we, also, um, we also care about this subject a lot because especially through the clean cooking value change, the people who design the cook stoves, who manufacture them, who go out and distribute them, there's a real opportunity for economic empowerment for both men and women who work in the sector. And because on the whole, the sector has the potential to promote inclusive gender equitable development. Then, so as Rachel gave, said in that overview, we've worked with the Alliance to create what we're considering a global social impact measurement system, which has sort of three general um, goals or, or, or three main reasons why this is relevant. Um, first, clean cooking implementers, that's many of you, the ones who are going out and actually distributing and selling these cook stoves, researchers and investors can be in alignment about how to define this very difficult concept that we're calling social impact that's created by the clean cooking sector. Clean cooking implementers have clear guidance on how to collect and use the social impact data, and they can use this information to monitor progress and improve their business model, as well as to promote their work and actually attract more funding. And we're hoping that's something that really comes out of this effort. And the clean cooking sector as a whole can aggregate its social impacts at the global level and use that information to drive more attention and more funding to the sector. So what the social measurement impact system actually is, and in the, the document that the Alliance will be releasing later this week, it'll all be outlined in great detail. So I'll keep referring to that document because we hope you'll take a look at it. But essentially it consists of three tools. There's an organizational social impact survey, and a social impact survey that you can administer to employees or entrepreneurs with your organization or company. And there's a <clears throat> social impact survey for the users of the cook stove. So if you're a company, these are customers. If you're an implementer, these are people who, to whom the stove 
have been distributed. So first I'll talk Join a little bit the about meeting. the Organizational Social Impact Survey, which is a very high-level sort of document, um, a survey Joining the meeting. that basically we would ask one of your senior staff people at the organization to complete once a year, and it allows you to sort of summarize the impact of your organization's operations, and it may help you to meet some of the requirements of donors and investment investors, who, especially those who are interested in how gender equitable your company is as a whole. So along the area, in terms of the areas of social impact this survey covers, there's employment information, sort of the number of people at your organization, how many are men and women, how is it distributed between part-time and full-time, between temporary and permanent positions, and the, the value chain in which employees are working, the geographic locations in which your employees work, and the wages employees earn. And there specifically, we're looking for things like a, you know, a gender wage gap, which we know can be common. Um, there's questions in there on training, what kind of trainings your company has offered, and whether uh, employees or entrepreneurs have completed those trainings, the kinds of trainings and their duration. Ownership, this is a very common um, iris indicator, as some of you might be familiar with, um, that looks at, you know, what percentage of the company is women held. And then there's the, the questions around the demand side, financial and non-financial support that you might provide to your customers, for instance, financing for buying the cook stove or support for uh, using the cook stove, like trainings and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> the Employee Entrepreneur Social Impact Survey is meant to be administered to people who work for you, whether as employees or as entrepreneurs. We know that many of you use entrepreneurs, especially in the distribution of your cook stove. So the idea behind this survey is to really capture what kind of changes are happening in the lives of people who work for you and who work in your value chain. So the survey is actually two surveys. There's a, there's a quote-unquote baseline survey that's um, filled out by your employee very soon after they start working for you. And then again, either six months or one year later, depending on how much turnover your organization has and what's more practical for you to use. Um, and so this survey, it captures a lot of indicators around livelihood. What, what's ha what kind of changes are happening in the lives of your employees and entrepreneurs in terms of their income, in terms of the skills they're developing in their work and how that relates to their lives. Um, their access to and use of financial services and credit. This is particularly relevant because, especially for women, access to credit is an is a extreme barrier. And we've, we've read a lot, and you know, all these indicators, again, are based on, as Rachel said, a lot of research, a lot of consultation, both with partners and with stakeholders. And we know that having employment and building business skills can actually improve access to financial services and credit. Access to and participation in networks, which can be very important for developing um, business skills and also improving, you know, your own sense of empowerment and your own ability to move forward. Um, then there's this very difficult concept of empowerment and agency, which the survey tries to measure in a variety of ways. There's measures on self-efficacy, on community communication skills, on decision making, who in the household makes decisions, and you know, we're looking for whether or not there's more gender equitable distribution of decision making and some of these other things within the household. And then changes in status. If you're somebody who works for one of these cook stove organizations and you're seen as working for something very um, technologically advanced and you're you know, bringing improvements to your community, that could mean that your status in the community is, is going up as well. The survey also me uh, measures access to and participation in training and mentoring, both within the company for which your employees and entrepreneurs work, but also outside of there. And there's a measure for business autonomy and efficacy. What kind of skills are your employees and entrepreneurs gaining, specifically related to their business skills and their ability to um, make set goals, reach goals, and their, their sort of confidence in their own ability to be effective business people, because we know that some of you are really providing wonderful opportunities for your employees and entrepreneurs to build those skills. <clears throat> and then finally, there's the user social impact survey. The reason we don't call it the customer social impact survey is because many we know many of you work with or are 
implementers that are distributing the cook stoves or have some sort of hybrid model in which you distribute the cook stove, but for instance, participants buy the fuel. So we use the more neutral term user social impact survey, but essentially this covers the customers, the end users of the cook stoves and fuels. So the respondents are the users of the cook stoves and fuels. Like the employee entrepreneur survey, this is a survey that's meant to capture changes and therefore it's administered twice. Once either just before or just after the customer or user receives or buys the cook stove or fuel. And again, either six months or one year later, and that depends on your organization's capacity and interest and how easy it is to follow up with customers and users. Um, one other thing note, to note there is we've actually designed two versions of this survey. There's a phone version and an in-person version. So depending on what's easier and more viable for your team, um, you can capture this data either by content, contacting users by phone or by following up with them in person. And this survey measures changes at the individual and household level, looking for what kind of changes are happening to people in their households from using this clean and or efficient cook stove or fuel. <clears throat> so in terms of areas of social impact this survey covers, it's quite a range because we really know that the effects can be wide ranging. So there's household economic stability, usage and adoption of cook stoves and fuels and cooking time. We know that many of you are curious to find out how much are these stoves actually being used by people and how much are they continuing to engage in stove stacking or perhaps continuing to use their old stoves and only intermittently using the new cook stoves. Um, cooking dynamics, in other words, who does the cooking and, and who's involved in the cooking because we know that sometimes actually men are excited about this new piece of technology in the household and they actually begin to take part in cooking where they didn't used to do so before. Um, drudgery related to cooking, by which we mean sort of the, the level of effort involved, sort of the distance traveled and the amount of, sorry, when we're talking about cooking, we mean the, the amount of effort and how much, you know, physical intensity is involved with doing the cooking and tending the fire. And then safety and health risks associated with cooking, for instance, burns and, and respiratory um, difficulty and that sort of thing. In terms of fuel procurement, by procurement we Joining mean collection meeting. or buying Kate Lord Morgan. fuel. So this includes how much spending on fuel, the amount of time household is spending collecting fuel or going out to buy it, drudgery, in this case the distance traveled and the amount of weight household members are carrying, um, the safety and protection risks involved with collecting or buying fuel. Then w the survey also captures some questions on income earned through the productive use of cook stoves and fuels. So for instance, if your user has a business in which they use the cook stove, that's something that's very interesting to capture. Um, are they perhaps, you know, selling uh, street food and are they able to cook the food more quickly and therefore produce more of the food to sell? Um, then there's a question on perception of status within the community as a result of buying or receiving the cook stove. And then there's some questions that will look familiar to many of you around customer satisfaction with the cook stove. So I want to sort of hone in on a few of these and show you some examples of what data, um, what the findings could look like. Um, I've, I'm drawing from examples from the field, um, from data that we've collected from some of the Alliance partners. But this is all sort of hypothetical data that will show you what you might be able to capture if you try to implement this survey. So for instance, cooking time, what we did, um, this is for the Kenya context, but what the survey does is it really allows you to customize to what your organization or company needs. So um, we asked about five standard uh, cooking tasks that an average household is likely to do. So in the case of Kenya, um, but in, in, in your case it may be different, but we generally ask about one hot beverage that most households uh, drink a lot in the day, so usually that's either tea or coffee. Then we ask about sort of three standard cooking dishes that are very likely to be made on a daily or weekly basis by members of the household. And then we ask about heating water for bathing or cooking. And so in this case, um, for these five tasks, um, the survey allows you to ask these questions of participants at baseline and again at a follow-up period 
And then you might see changes in the amount of time households are spending cooking each of these, um, conducting each of these cooking tasks at baseline and at this follow-up period. Um, measuring drudgery is one of those difficult things that um, are one of those things that's very difficult to capture. So what we use instead of a scale from one to five is we use this illustration of a woman sort of rolling a rock up a hill and it gets more difficult as the rock gets bigger. And so we use this in the field as a way to kind of gauge, well, how much effort is involved with fuel collection? How easy is it? And kind of use this illustration to get a sense of how you would measure something like that. So this is just sort of an illustration of something in the survey for the in-person version. Um, changes in household fuel expenditure. So we, we try to be very specific in how we capture these changes in the survey. And so rather than asking about, oh, how much money do you spend on fuel overall in a month, there are very specific questions about how frequently do you go out and buy this fuel, how much do you spend on each trip, are there changes in the dry season or the rainy season? And so you come up with this sort of graph from baseline and then again at the follow-up period where you can maybe see that expenditures on some fuels are going down, especially if, for instance, households are switching over from a wood-burning fire to a pellet stove, then maybe expenditures on wood go down and pellets obviously go from zero to um, a certain amount per month. So this is another thing that you could Come out that could come out of the user social impact survey if you were to measure this. Um, then there's questions around customer satisfaction. We know that many of you are interested in this. So, for instance, you know, what did customers like about the cook stove? So these are some of the examples of what we've seen when we field tested this question. Um, a lot of people talk about these sort of general themes in terms of what they liked about the cook stove. Um, so I'm pulling this one in as an example of useful information for you and for your company to know so that you can maybe adapt the cook stove or adapt your marketing based on some of this information. So the social impact measurement resources are going to be available for download online. I believe they'll go live later this week. Um, but just to give you an overview of what will be online, there's the Measuring Social Impact in the Clean and Efficient Cooking Center sector how-to guide, and this really goes through in great detail everything I've just talked about, um, and it even goes through each Joining of the surveys, the which will also be linked and available for, for download, and talks about each of the sort of modules within the survey. What is it trying to measure? Why would this be interesting to your organization or enterprise? Um, what kind of information can you get out of it? What kind of indicators come out of taking those measures? And how would you be able to actually use that information in a helpful way? In each of the surveys, and as I mentioned, the Employee Entrepreneur Social Impact Survey is actually two surveys. There's a baseline and a follow-up. And the User Social Impact Survey is actually divided into four. There's baseline, either phone version or in-person version, and follow-up, either phone version or in-person version. All of these are in Word form so that you can go into those documents and you can change um, the wording of questions. You can make the example specific to your context. So, for instance, the five cooking tasks can be relevant to your context. You can take out modules that aren't interesting to your organization. So, really, we've made them as sort of user-friendly as we can. We've used a lot of colored font to let you know this is sort of something that you should definitely include in the survey. This one is optional. This is where you would want to make the language very specific to the context. But everything is there for you to use and to adapt to meet your needs. Um, so I think that's all from me. Yeah, and I, this is Rachel again. I'll just add that the URL up on the page right now is correct. However, we've also made a much more user-friendly URL that will direct to this page. And so it's going to be cleancookstove.org backslash social impact. And I will confirm now that it is available on the website, which I'm very excited to announce. Great. So um, I think that's all for me. Great. Um, thank you, Lillian, and for that terrific presentation. Uh, we will now open the floor to any questions. Please type your question into the chat window. And it looks like Ziwa has kicked us off. Um, Ziwa asks, 
when we say customers um, like this, a stove because it saves time, um, how do they translate this benefit or how do they explain this? Please? Yeah, so there's actually two ways in which we get at the question of how customers um, decide that the cook stove saves time. One is we actually try to capture this in um, by actually measuring time. So in the in-person user survey, we ask them how many times a week do they prepare a certain do they do a certain cooking task or prepare a certain kind of food? And then how long does it typically take them? Which cook stoves do they use? It's a, it's a series of measurements that really tries to get down to a specific amount of time that people take to prepare that, to do that cooking task. And so if you aggregate it up to the week, um, you come up with a weekly amount of time spent doing each of these cooking tasks, which is what that graph I pulled up shows. And so, We've actually been able to find through our pilot testing of this tool um, that from baseline to the follow-up period, you can actually see changes in the amount of time households are spending cooking some of these foods because they have switched over from one kind of cook stove to another, especially a more efficient cook stove. Um, beyond that, we actually ask people from a perception perspective, do they think they're spending more time, less time, or about the same amount of time preparing their um, food or doing their cooking tasks? And there's a more or less or about the same question in there. So we measure it. We try to measure it both from a, um, you know, data perspective. We try to measure it actually as, you know, minutes per week. And then we also measure it as a question of perception. And then finally, at the end of the survey, there's questions about customer satisfaction. And so when you ask that question, some people will say, I like this cook stove because it actually saves me time. I cook more quickly. So there's actually that, that same concept is arrived at in three different ways, you know, through minutes per week, through perception asked outright, and then also through a customer raising it themselves if they're asked about their satisfaction with the cook stove. Perfect. Um, you know, I hope that answered your question. Soma asks, can you share or discuss some indicators of decision making at the entrepreneurial level? Okay. So, um, indicators of decision making at the entrepreneurial level. So, um, there's sort of two le levels of this. One is um, intra household decision making, because one thing that the Alliance is very interested in, and ICRW, of course, as a gender research organization, we are very interested in, is gender equitable. Um, household relations and whether we can sort of see, we can move the needle on intra-household dynamics. And so we ask about using, you know, very standard, standardized measurements, measurements that have been used by the uh, Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index and some of those other long-standing um, measurement frameworks. We look at um, who makes decisions in the households related to, for instance, buying a household asset or certain other decisions, who makes those? Is it the husband? Is it the wife? Is it a joint decision? Is it someone else in the household that makes that decision? And so there's an index there that sort of looks at various questions around decision making and then asks who makes those decisions. And so you ask that question at baseline and again in the follow-up to sort of get at those potential changes. Um, there's also questions in the employee entrepreneur uh, survey specifically around sort of decision-making or effectiveness or self-efficacy within the workplace. So questions around, you know, how easy is it for you to set goals for yourself and then stick to those goals, um, things like that, which are a little bit more around what a person's confidence in their own ability to make decisions or to, to take on a difficult task is. Um, and we sort of get at it in that way. hope that answers it. Um, so Judith um, asks about trying to balance the privacy of the employee slash end user while um, trying to fulfill the need to collect meaningful data to make decisions and understand your impact. Would you like to speak to that, Lillian? Yeah, so that's the question there. Okay. So that is an excellent question, and it's one that we as a research organization that uses, you know, um, that goes through all the internal processes and gets ethical review of each and every one of our studies to make sure that any human subjects research we do is effectively um, 
handled. We certainly care about that a great deal. And so in the how-to guide that's going live, um, there are very specific instructions for how to safeguard the privacy uh, of your employees. So what we recommend is that um, for the organizational survey, it's somebody at the higher level who already knows a lot of this information, you know, what are the average wages paid to employees, they already have access to all of that and they can calculate that very easily. For the employee entrepreneur survey, we recommend that an organization hires one or, one or two or looks internally for one or two, for instance, an M&E officer or an HR officer who would be responsible for collecting this data from the other employees entrepreneurs and they would have to have a very explicit understanding with the employee or entrepreneur that this data is confidential, will not be traced back to that individual person, their answers will be kept private, the information that they give will be kept separate from their name. And there's actually, um, in the guide, we have included at the very end consent um, information sheets where we have um, exam example language for what, a, what an m and &E officer or someone like that at your organization could say and present to the employee entrepreneur in terms of their rights, you know, their right to not answer any question they're not comfortable answering, their right to walk away if they're uncomfortable, and their, their guarantees of sort of privacy and confidentiality. So there's language included in there that we recommend strongly that you do read to your employees and entrepreneurs. In addition to that, there's a section in the how-to guide about best practices for um, keeping information confidential and how to how to conduct surveys in an ethical manner. So, you know, you don't do this in the middle of the workplace where everybody else can overhear. You do it in a separate room where you can close the door. Um, so all these things are sort of, we, we did our best to provide a lot of guidance for you about how to best implement this in a way that will make your employees and entrepreneurs comfortable and keep them from, um, you know, make make sure that you get access to this really useful information in a way that does not um, interfere with their privacy or in any way expose them to unnecessary harm. Great question. Uh, question from Fanny. Um, from the case studies, uh, were there um, adequate and effective response rates from employees and end users? So the pilot studies we did were quite small sample sizes because um, we were really trying to test how effective are these questions, are they capturing what we want them to capture, are we able to get at the measures we want to get at, and of course from one pilot to the next we did a lot of adaptations of the questions. So the sample sizes were quite small. I think the largest we got to was 17 um, customers. Excuse me. Um, so they were quite small, but people were willing to um, engage in, in the survey. They were willing to answer the questions. And, you know, I think when you see some of the findings, it is exciting enough that you'll be willing to go after some of your customers. And if you can't get them, go out and get some more, because there are some very interesting findings there. And, and it's really wonderful to be able to point out and say, look, we interviewed X number of customers, and we actually found that overall there was a reduction in time spent on fuel collection, for instance. Great. And I think that answers also one of Ziwa's follow-up questions, as well as, um, oh, and <clears throat> Ziwa also asked, what were the respondents' income levels? So um, the pilot testing we did was, you know, in, this, in fairly er rural areas for the most part. Um, so these were low, for the most part, low income, maybe low to slightly more moderate income respondents. It kind of depended on the situation because we pilot tested this in a couple different, first of all, countries, and then second of all, with different companies who had different customer bases. And, you know, um, usually the more sort of expensive advanced stove is something that can only be afforded by someone who's got maybe a little bit more of a steady income. So it really varied, um, but for the most part, these were, you know, poor people in generally rural areas where we tested this. And to that point, Nike's question, uh, where were these research studies carried out? Right. So there was one in India. We did two in Kenya and one in Uganda. Um, and can it be replicated in other countries? Absolutely. That's the whole idea behind this. We've tried to make the surveys as sort of universal as we can in terms of certain measures, and then we have included a lot of room for you to adapt it to the local context. So 
If a question isn't suitable to your context, you can take it out or you could reword it. So when we ask, for instance, about status, you know, what is defined as a high status, somebody who has a high status in your community, that varies from community to community. So we, we allow for you to, for instance, change the examples for what a, how you would define someone with high status so that you can make it really relevant to the local context. And um, the same thing with sort of some of these other questions. So what kind of fuel your collection is very collecting or buying is very context specific and what kind of meals you're cooking is context specific. So we really take that into account, but the but the goal of this is really that once you make those adaptations, you can use the survey in hopefully just about any country where you're hoping to gather this data. So um, James has switched gears a little bit here and asked about the catalog of communications materials um, and when will that be available. Terrific question, I can speak to that. So um, we will be accepting submissions in the catalog through November 18th and uh, we hope to have the catalog available to all our partners um, within a few weeks after the submission date. So please stay tuned, we will be meeting announcements periodically in our newsletter and on our website. Um, so we look forward to your submission. Great. Um, SETI asks, um, so is this framework mainly intended for Alliance partners um, or will there be a broader sharing opportunity of the results um, to other sectors, I presume? Um, and yeah, so so can you speak to how broad we will be sharing this and how applicable this may be to other sectors? Sure. Um, so this is Rachel. I can address that question. Um, right now, the framework is intended to be used by individual organizations, and there's not a global database or aggregator for all of that information. However, um, so that so with that, that means that the information you do collect around these surveys um, will be proprietary, and so it'll be you know, at the discretion of organizations to share with the Alliance, but we do encourage you to do so um, to the extent Joining possible. Joining the meeting. And of course, all of the Alliance grantees under the Women's Empowerment Fund and other grant mechanisms are required to collect data around these social impact indicators and share them with us um, but we do not automatically share them publicly. So um, that's going to be what I would consider the next step in this process for us to look into an opportunity to create a more global online database where partners can feed their different data into so that eventually we will be able to include it, you know, in our annual reporting for the entire Alliance partnership, as well as um, hopefully, you know, eventually get to a point where partners can receive some type of certification from the Alliance and ICRW showing that they have, you know, followed this rigorous process and that by um, demonstrating some of these social impacts in their business, investors and donors will know that they've used this rigorous process. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, see some comments. Um, there are some questions on accessing the PowerPoint. Uh, we will have this presentation available on our YouTube channel within the next uh, few business days, but i um, happy to send a pared-down version um, to you, um, and please feel free to email either me or Rachel to um, obtain a copy of the presentation. Scrolling down here. Um, so we don't have any more um, questions in the public chat yet, but we'll hold on for a few more minutes to allow people to type in any last minute questions. That's a terrific point, Judith. Um, so as many of you already, are, many entrepreneurs and organizations collect a lot of this very informative and comprehensive data. 
And for those partners who would like to share their experiences um, with using this tool or any other types of frameworks, we would be happy to facilitate exchanges and lessons learned between different partners. So Judith, for example, if you'd like to get in touch with us on that, we would love to work with you and anyone else on that kind of endeavor. So Candice asks, um, in this framework, are there any additional indicators on income benchmarking in various regions and countries? Um, for example, quality of work based on income level. That's a very good question. <clears throat> I think we're, we weren't necessarily thinking of benchmarking uh, income to either other companies within the country or to sort of average levels of the country as a whole, although I go, I guess that is something you could do. But um, the surveys aim to get more of, more, sorry, aim to get more at internal parity. So looking at um, who's working in your organization at various levels of the value chain, right? Who are the temporary, maybe lower wage employees and who are at the highest levels and then looking whether looking to see whether there's gender parity within that. So, for instance, um, if your organization has an awful lot of high-level managers and executives, and all of them are male, but everybody working on the production line and being paid minimum wage is female, that might sort of trigger for you some internal uh, thinking about how what you might be able to do to address that, or how this came to be, or maybe what kind of gaps you should maybe think about filling within your recruitment or training processes to sort of maybe um, get at more gender parity within the workplace. So in terms of the quality of the jobs and the payment of the jobs, we really meant for that to be an internal metric. And these are based, a lot of these measures in that survey are based on the Joining IRS the meeting. that look for, um, you know, gender disaggregated data on wages and, 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 and employment levels and employment hierarchies and trying to get at, you know, maybe that might re lead to a response within your organization that, you know, leads to some full searching around, okay, why are we, why are we this way? How did this come to be and what can we do to address it rather than looking for external benchmarks um, uh, against which to compare income levels and that sort of thing. All right. Uh, Claire asks, is there a plan to develop a survey um, on electronic support, tablets, smartphones, et cetera? Yeah, thanks, Claire, for the question. It's definitely something that the Alliance and ICRW are jointly interested in doing, and that kind of feeds into our aspiration for a more global level aggreg aggregator type system. Um, so we are looking at different opportunities with partners within and without the clean cooking sector who may have already, you know, such as Salesforce, who may have already designed this type of tool or hosted this type of platform in the past. So the Alliance is currently um, fundraising for opportunities like that, and so we don't yet have the resources that we would like to have to do so, but it's definitely in our um, near-term goal. Yeah, and from ICRW's perspective, too, um, doing this on paper is nice, but we would love to get to a point where all this is automated and makes it much easier to get this high-level data quickly and make it very easy to compare and, and aggregate. And once we have that kind of platform available, we will let all of you know about it. Um, uh, SETI asks, um, um, so I, if I understand it correctly, um, a in, did this kind of framework and the indicators include safety of cook stove use? Um, and <clears throat> yes, how were this addressed or integrated? Right. So one thing I should mention, and I think Rachel did at the beginning, is that the alliance has sort of divided up the the measurement of impact from clean and efficient cook stoves into three buckets. One being environmental benefits, right? So all that indoor air pollution, all those kinds of very technical and, and environmental measures. Then there's the health measures, so, you know, uh, lung, lung diseases and pneumonia and those sorts of things that we know are associated with cook stoves and take a terrible toll on human life. 
and then the social impact indicators with a special emphasis on gender, and that's the, the strain that ICRW worked on. But keeping that in mind, even though there is a separate process underway to measure some of those health impacts, um, we did include some measures around safety and health around cook stove usage because we knew that the health survey may not capture some of that. So there are questions at baseline and follow-up around, um, let me think, burns, uh, eye irritation, nose and throat irritation, um, lung, uh, like a respiratory, respiratory, um, respiratory issues, um, I think sort of heart, heart palpitations or that sort of thing. Um, they're not highly scientific. They're more sort of perception how often in the past X number of months did you or someone in your household experience these things while engaging in cooking. Um, so those are the kinds of safety and health measures that the survey includes. And again, this is asked at baseline and again at the follow-up period in time so that you can see if there were any changes. And for instance, in the pilot testing we did, we did see some decreases in, in things like eye irritation, I think, when we measured that. A few more minutes. Um, any last minute? And one thing that I'll just say, well, since there's no question on, um, so around the issue of, you know, collecting um, data, doing on, you know, tablet or smartphone-based surveys, I would encourage um, partners who, you know, maybe identify a funding opportunity where they want to develop a platform like that for their business or build off of an existing partner, I encourage you to, you know, pursue funding opportunities like that and consider partnering with ICRW, for example, who can provide you some of that added technical assistance. Um, and so I just do want to kind of put that out there as part of the reason why we like to convene these partner webinars is to give people different ideas about partnership opportunities and that it's not only just partnering with the alliance, but looking kind of within the partnership at how you can um, create synergy and new opportunities amongst yourselves. Um, yeah, terrific point, Rachel. Um, if there are no remaining questions left, um, we will conclude the webinar. Uh, thank you all again for your participation and for your time. We very much appreciate your willingness to learn more about this really important framework um, and how it can benefit your organization as well as the broader sector. Um, please look out for a recording of our presentation on our YouTube channel. And should you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We look forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye.
joining the meeting. Um, Jim Scuff. Bye. 